Let, let me just see, is everybody able to uh Right. Yeah, I think if you're if you're having issues, if maybe you could just on on the reactions put up an X and yeah, um, okay. we could help you or or put a message on on Slack. Otherwise, we'll assume that. Um, yeah, let's uh, if you are able to open this and just run through the few first few blocks. It just load the all the necessary libraries and uh, uh, do some plotting setup. I mean, if there are quite if there are problems, it should already be popped up over uh, at, at this point. Yeah, and uh, just to run through the blocks until you you get to this uh, Jetscape uh, uh, cartoon. Okay, uh, so let me see if there are any. Okay, then let's get start to what's in this uh, notebook. So this notebook uh, is really will help you go over a full process, almost uh, the full process of uh, running the Bayesian analysis from the prior. Uh, the first section will understand how we generate the prior and uh, uh, understand a few important features of how we parameterize the shear and bulk viscosities. And then we will load the simulation data. This is usually the most uh, time consuming part where you have to really run 500 uh, mod true model evaluations at 500 different uh, data uh, input points. But this has already been done, so we can directly load this. And then we'll have the data pre processing uh, and perform the principal component analysis. And then we'll load all the experimental data to be used in the comparisons. And finally, we'll build the Gaussian process emulators for each of the principal components that we're going to use. So these are all the preparations uh, to define the posterior. And finally, we will use them to, to, <clears throat> to, to perform the full analysis. Uh, and we will run the MCMC. Uh, 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 MCMC chains on, on the posteriors. Of course, this method, uh, sorry, it's, this procedure will also take a, a, a lot of time, but we have al already uh, provided you the some pre-generated MCMC samples that you can directly load into the notebook and see what happens. After that, uh, if you have your own time, you can also try to run the new, new MCMC chain on your own. Okay, uh, so the first step is try to understand the prior. So here in this block, let's run it. I provide you the actual parameterizations in the Jetscape analysis for zeta over s and eta over s. In this case, you, you will notice that uh, at each temperature, it's parameterized by four parameters, the maximum, t, the width, and the symmetries for Data OS, and this is also data OS. So the exercise uh, that we're going to do right now is just to plot all of this uh, 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 this eight parameters and and see what, what, what type of uh, viscosities they they look like. So this is just a plotting script. Let's run it. So you notice that uh, what we what we do is that we generate a uh, a thousand random samples for four random variables, and we will rescale each variables into the range of the design range. In this case, for example, TK is varied from 0.13 to 0.3 uh, GeV. The slope at lower temperatures and the slope at higher temperatures, and this is the uh, king uh, shear viscosities. And in this case, it will give you the medium, the 60%, 90%, 95%, and the 100% uh, quite a interval of the, the prime. 
So in this case, you already see that this prior is not uniform, even though we parameterize each of the parameters to be a uniform distribution. And you can, you can also perform the same for, uh, for, for, for bulk viscosities, and that's uh, the median, 60, 90, 97.5 uh, and 100. So you already see that in the prior distributions, you already have uh, this typical shape that it first grows with temperature and then decreases at high, high temperature built in. So there's one question regarding the prior is that uh, whether there are some uh, non-trivial correlations in the prior. For example, if we use some rig data to constrain it over S at low temperatures, does the prior become too restrictive at high temperatures? That it may cause tensions with LHC data. So, so this is just some other test tools to help you understand the prior. Is that uh, you? Uh, I'll keep track of where I do have questions. Okay. You specify a temperature range, and then you only generate uh, those functions from our uh, 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 random prior that, that uh, <clears throat> it actually gives you a viscosity that's within uh, 0.15 and 0.2 within a temperature range of T smaller than uh, 200, 200 MeV. Okay, and this is what it gives you. This may take some time, uh, depending on the uh, system. Okay, so, so these are all the functions that uh, you can sample uh, from the, the, the JetScape prior that uh, uh, viscosities below 200 MeV has to lie somewhere between 0.15 and 0.2. Of course, it uh, still will diverge uh, in those temperature regions that is not constrained, but you can compare this uh, new prior at high temperatures before and after you provide some low temperature constraints. So notice that uh, these uh, black curves are, uh, let me see. Uh, so, so what I plotted over here is actually the distribution at, uh, 150, uh, at, at, at 500 MeV. So notice that by constraining uh, the low temperatures prior, your high temperature prior is actually actually gets affected. So, so that's some feature that uh, we have to always keep in mind that uh, although we don't include any data in this region, but by just your prime parameterizations, you can already introduce some of these correlations that may, uh, may, may make your analysis more, more complex. So you can also try to, uh, at this point, try to plot the prior at uh, for example what i just plotted is uh the high temperature prior At 0.4, I can now plot it at 0.5. So you can you can change this. Uh, try. So in this case. At 500 temperatures, 500 MeV, the prior basically recovers what you parameterized I say <laughs> in, in the beginning. So, so even though your, your temperature, uh, your, your priors are uh, restrictive uh, below, if you, you have had some data that constrain your ETA OS below 200 MeV, your prior at high temperatures high enough will not be affected by that, uh, by, 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 by that effect. So this is means that at least uh, in, in this temperature region, this uh, parameterization is still flexible enough 
to allow data at uh, to allow the combined use of data sensitive to both low and high temperatures. So, so it's very important that you, you perform this check uh, in your own analysis before you try to include the different data sets. Is there any question at this point? Uh, you can directly type in the chat or in Slack. Okay. So now let's load the, let, let, so, so after you have uh, performed this prior part, let's go to the design. So the design is that we pull about 500 samples from the prior region and we will perform actual model calculations. So this will give you what our the design looks like. So when you may notice that uh, after you load the design, it will also print the first five designs as examples. You can see all the values corresponds to each parameters in each design. And you may notice that uh, uh, there is only 485 number of design for each of the 17 parameters. Uh, the reason that it's less than 500 because we uh, before we, we performed the prior, there's some uh, uh, some, 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 some parameters, some corners in the parameter space that may, may not allow your model to run properly. We have already included the, some of these uh, 15 points where it gives you quite uh, unreasonable uh, observable calculations. So, so in this process, we, we remove some of the outliers that uh, uh, you get into very unreasonable parameter space. And I mean, in the end, we still have uh, almost 500 design points to train our emulators. This. And then let's uh, load all the experimental observables. Here is the list of the experimental variables that we use in the analysis. We'll load from the, the data file that we just downloaded. Uh, there are 110 data points at uh, 2.76 TV. These are just our or just for keeping giving this uh, observables names and what's the trialities and uh, we'll organize them in groups. There are some useful definitions while you may, may make the plots. Let's run it. And then finally, in this block, it will plot all the experimental observables with their uncertainties. So you will get uh, a result that looks like this the charge particle densities, uh, pi on chi on proton multiplicities, their mean PT, uh, this is the harmonic flows, and this is the mean PT fluctuations. All of them, where we included them up to 70% centralities. Okay. So now let's uh, load the training data. So the training data are those uh, calculations at each of the design point that takes you uh, millions of CPU hours. So now we can just load them. So again, here what's showed is the uh, first five of design points and what their corresponding observables are. So notice that there are also 485 design points. And now you have uh, 110 observables associated to each of them. <clears throat> and, and within each row, you will all these observables listed. <clears throat> so, Apart from the design points, we also generate a smaller design, which is will be used as validations. So the validation is that uh, you, you use this 
you use the other ones we trained our emulators and build the whole Bayesian framework using this large design, you can verify whether it can successfully infer the, the, the true parameters using pseudo data generated from this uh, smaller design. So we'll use this uh, at the very end, or if we don't have time, you are encouraged to try to do some validation uh, after this. So, so this is basically have the same structure as the, the sample in the study, just that they are sampled at some new parameter points. And finally, we load all the design parameters again, just to uh, for, for this validation set. So, so this will be the true parameters uh, that corresponds to this pseudo data. Okay, and then there's an important state, a step to is that you plot all your design calculations versus data. Uh, so, so this may, let me take, may take some time because there are many, many, many lines to, to draw for each of the design points. Just uh, give it a few more seconds. It will overlay all the design calculations with experimental data. And what's important to check is that uh, the design calculation provides the good coverage of the experimental data. So such that we are uh, more or less sure that uh, uh, there has to be at least one set of parameters somewhere in the parameter space that can provide a, a description of the experimental data. If you, you find that your design space, for example, can never cover certain data point, no matter how much you vary the, the parameters, then, then you're, you're, you're in trouble because even you, 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 you perform the whole Bayesian analysis, it will never be able to find the, the useful set of parameters. But right now we, we can check that uh, uh, for most of the cases, there are uh, good coverage of design uh, or uh, the, the, the design calculation of the experimental data point. Another point that you need to check this is because we are going to use this design to build the emulators. If your experimental data somehow lies at the very edge of your design where there's not too much training data, it also means that once you try to calibrate the model to the experimental data, you are relying on your emulators in regions where there is not much training data and you may have a significantly larger emulator uncertainties. So it's very important to check this plot before you run uh, any analysis, uh, ongoing analysis. Okay, that's all the preparation stuff. Now the true statistical analysis will begin here. Uh, we will first do the training data preprocessing is that we will uh, standardize all the observables. This is because your observables has very large range of values numerically. For example, number of charged particles that typically range from a thousand to uh, and more. Uh, but for V2, its value is usually about 0.1 to 0.1. So it's you send, Basically, this is not something that uh, uh, can be very well handled by numerics. So what we do is that we will first of all standardize these observables by removing the mean and then divide it by the variance from the distribution of your design calculations so that these observables will become order one quantities to be treated all together. So this is uh, already provided by the uh, SKLearn standard scalar transformer is just take the mean and uh, divide it by the var uh, divide by the standard deviations. And the next step is to do the dimensional reductions of the observables via PCA. Uh, of course, there are some discussions that you can you can think of whether PCA is always necessary 
and uh, what are the differences of directly training on the observables versus tr training using PC transformations. So if you, if you, have, you have time, you're encouraged to, to, to try to uh, that's the differences of, of these few options. But here we'll always use PCA in order to, uh, first of all, capture the empirical correlations and to uh, improve the, the efficiency of the analysis. So here we do the PCA by, first of all, uh, transform the, uh, so first transform all the observables by the standard scalar. And then remember that what we want to do is to uh, diagonalize the covariance matrix. This is the same as doing the singular value decomposition of this uh, observable matrix. And what you have is that you have a 485 by 485 uh, matrices. And uh, the transformation matrix is over here. And in the middle, this S will contain all the uh, 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 singular values, which are the principal, so the variance explained by each principal component. And here, what I plotted is the, the, the a similar plot as in the lecture is that you plot the relative importance of each principal components. In this case, on a log scale, on the right is the cumulative importance of the principal components. Uh, so you notice that the first one already explains almost the 40%, 45% of the total data uh, observable variance. The second one, another 30%. And then gradually you, you, you recover uh, all of the variance, including more and more uh, principal components. So now if you plot the variance on the log scale, you notice some very interesting structure is that uh, you have the, the relative importance of each principal component, first of all, decreasing uh, strongly uh, when you go to higher order principal components. But after some point, it starts to decrease with another slope. In this case, uh, you can understand in this way is that uh, uh, in the simulations, you have both features and the random fluctuations, which actually you can see already in this plot. So especially for this uh, mean PT fluctuation observables, you if you look at individual lines of the design calculation, you have uh, random fluctuations, which are the white noise that we call, we have said that uh, are always uncorrelated from other features in your data. In this case, when you do the Fourier, uh, sorry, PCA transform, those white noise will appear as some some structureless uh, uh, features in in, uh, in in the PCA. In this case, they are not features, and they they're just transformation of the noise, and the noise has similar order of magnitude. That's what you see over here. That's why you have the kink that separate the features from what a higher order principal components that contains more fraction of noises. So usually, uh, if you can clearly see this feature in its transformation, that we can say that maybe we, all we need to do is to include up to maybe 12 features. Above that, it's both inefficient, they are explain less variance, and you are mostly just try to model the, the noise in your model. Uh, okay, so right now, I actually generated all 15 PCs for you. Uh, we will keep the 15 principal components. And the training of the principal components also takes time, but I think uh, you can also uh, load it directly from uh, data, uh, from, from the data table. Let's go through up here. So this is the, the training of the emulator stage that you import uh, the design matrix 
and then you, you try to train for each principal components. Uh, oh, sorry, it's over here. So, so here uh, you have this override option. So if override equals to true, you will uh, uh, retrain the emulators altogether, which will take uh, quite some time. So let's just uh, use uh, use false. In this case, you will uh, load pre-generated emulators. So these are loading the emulators, and these are the code for generating the emulator, uh, generating new emulators. So when you generate it, you first do the kernel. So for the kernel, we have the radio free, uh, radio basis function kernel, which is just a, a Gaussian that you can change the the, the kernel's uh, correlation lens and the variance. We also have a white noise kernel with the noise level can be changed from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the fourth power. And uh, when you fit the relation between design and the, the training data, the, the, the fitting procedure will try to optimize this variance, uh, this uh, correlation lens and noise level in order to achieve maximum likelihood of uh, predicting uh, this uh, training data. It will print out the Gaussian protest score. If the score is very close to one, then it means the training is, uh, should be successful. And in order to, to debug and to understand the features, we also print out uh, the actual optimized uh, parameters for this uh, hyperparam. Let, let's just uh, run it. Uh, Design my access not okay. Yeah. So so this is not the, the actual training. This is just loading uh, pre-trained emulators. So let's let's look at the, the output. So right now I have a fifteen uh, emulators for the first fifteen principal components. So it will all all the way prints PC number fourteen from from zero to fourteen. And within each, I print this information. First of all, this is the score. So you notice that the score is uh, very close to one for the first few PCs. And it should gradually decrease itself uh, when you go to higher PCs. Yeah, you can see for PC 11, the score is uh, it's not, not so good. It's about 0.47. And you notice that uh, the white noise level also start to increase from uh, a smaller PC to higher PCs. So in this case, if you go to the first few PCs, you notice that uh, the optimized uh, white noise kernel, so so basically how, how much uh, random fluctuation there could be in, in the data, uh, sorry, in your training data, as guessed by the Gaussian emulator. So this one, the noise level is 0.02, very small. Uh, second PC the noise level is also small. But if you go to the last few PCs, you start to notice that the noise level is huge. Uh, almost 50 or 30 percent uh, is better to be understand that uh, as white noise as, as compared to, to, to actual model features. So based on this, let's truncate it uh, around the first 12 PC, or in this case 11. You can also notice that uh, uh, it's the 11th PC is where you start to get uh, various bad scores and uh, the white noise level suddenly increases a lot. A lot. So you, you, can, you can try your own, but uh, either you can try 12 or, or 10. Uh, you're encouraged to, to vary this number uh, after this and uh, see how, how you get uh, uh, whether you get different results. Let's let's use 12 because right now your pre-generated data in the data table actually uses 12 pieces. Okay, let's use 12. And then this block is just uh, uh, this wrapper function that takes one model input parameters and gives you the uh, 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 projected uh, uh, model predictions with, with, with the 
the Gaussian emulator's uh, uncertainties. So what it does is just it takes the model input parameters and use the trend emulators to make predictions. <clears throat> of course, these predictions are the mean and the standard deviation in the principal component space. You have to apply the inverse transformation to get it back to the real space. And in this case, uh, you notice that uh, uh, the mean values in the physical space is this uh, transformation times the mean in the PCD space. But when you transform the uncertainties, the variance matrix in the physical space you have to apply uh, this matrix transformation for the variance from PCA back to the uh, to, to to the physical space. That's what you see over here. Is that uh, you you actually you have a transformations transpose transformation matrix to transform this variance matrix back to the uh, variance in the physical space. And then what this function returns is the mean of the predictions and the variance matrix of the prediction. Okay. So here, let's uh, with this we are we are basically done with uh, the, uh, the the machine learning part is that we have used this uh, PCA and emulator so that we can generate uh, fast model predictions with these functions, and now we can do the actual statistical analysis. So here you have one or two options: is that you can either do validations or do actual calibration on experiment data. So if do validation is if do validation is true, it means that you are using pseudo data generated from the model. If it's false, you will be calibrating to experimental data. Okay, so, so at this point, uh, let's do validation equals to true. And, and then after this, after we have go over this, I will let you to, to calibrate to experimental data. So we have, I have to actually provide you a hundred different sets of validation data. I mean, you can play with this validation uh, for, for if you have enough computational power, you can you can do it for for each one of them. Uh, so so maybe every one of them will take you hours to generate the MCMC chain. So right now, validation set zero has uh has three generated data. So let's let let's just take the zero. So so don't have to actually run the chain. You can just load the chain from uh, the data files. Of course, if you have experiments, then you can directly use the experimental uncertainties. But if you are doing validations, uh, when we're just giving it uh, some some very small uncertainties just uh, to to let it know that it's it's a because it's a perfect model, right? So, so in principle, if you run with high enough statistics, there should be no not any uncertainties in this case. Okay, and then after you have defined what is the experimental data, either your validation pseudo data or true experimental data, you can define the posterior. So to define the posterior, you first get the prior. In this case, we define the log of prior. Because we have uniform distributions, uh, the log of prior is zero if your parameters are within the range of design. It's minus infinity if the the parameter is outside of the range. Okay. 
and then we will define the likelihood function, which takes the input y and the covariance matrix. Uh, that's this multivariate normal form. And then you can use this to define the log likelihood. The log likelihood is that you take the model parameters and then you make the prediction using the Gaussian emulator of the mean and the variance at this point. And the delta y is the mean prediction minus the experimental variable, uh, experimental measurements. And the variance contains two parts. One is the experimental data variance. And the other part is the variance from the uh, Gaussian emulator uncertainties. And then this is the function that we just defined to compute uh, basically this uh, dy variance uh, dy. So, so this function will actually use some of the uh, Laplace functions to compute this, uh, this form very efficiently. <clears throat> okay, and for the MCMC sector, we are using a variant of the usual uh, MCMC algorithm. It's called the parallel tempered by MCMC package. So in this case, you just not use one chain, but you use n chains with each of the chain with uh, has uh, try 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 to sample from. A, a function like this. So in this case, the first chain where t uh, is equals to one, this is just the posterior that we want to sample. For higher chains, it uh, <clears throat> takes the post uh, likelihood to uh, one over t's power. So if you, you have a very large t, then this basically flattens out the features in the likelihood functions. And the algorithm is designed for such that uh, at some point, you have uh, uh, the, the the chains being uh, exchanged at between different temperatures. So you are running high temperature chains, which are featureless, to low temperature chains, which is the exact likelihood functions. The advantage of this uh, slightly variant of the parallel temperature approach is that it will prevent your chains to be trapped in the local minima because at high temperatures, since the likelihood function has been basically wiped into into a flat function you are less sensitive to local minima and then by by exchanging the, the chains between low temperature and high temperature chains you you can reduce the uh the risk uh, that the low temperature chain will be trapped by local minima and, and then will it will, it will it will explore the whole space more efficiently okay and right now Remember that to set this rank CMC equals to false, so that you are not really running the, the chain, but loading pre-generated chain. Uh, after this, this hands-on session, you are encouraged to uh, change it to true and maybe also prepare for to, to have a few hours to wait the chain to finish. Uh, right now we have uh, uh, <clears throat> 10 temperatures range from zero to uh, range from one to 10. We have a 17 dimensional parameter space. And for uh, each dimensions, usually we will uh, assign at least the 10 workers in order to this, this uh, PTMC, uh, MCMC algorithm to work properly. So usually we will just multiply dimensions by 10 or 20 <clears throat> to, to define the number of workers. And then we'll first run the MCMC for 200 steps, such that uh, uh, the, 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 the worker's position normalized to the target distributions. And then we'll pull a thousand uh, iterations to uh, as the final MCMC samples. <clears throat> okay, so, so now it totally takes no time to just load the chain. And, and here's the chain. 
So you have all 17 uh, dimension parameters and uh, this is the first five steps of the chain. And in total, we have uh, more than 40,000 uh, uh, steps. Uh, there's a homework exercise that uh, uh, is essentially, how do we know that uh, 200 steps will be enough for uh, the chain to already thermalize into the higher type of distributions? There are actually some diagnosis of the MCMC, like checking the correlation lens, et cetera, that helps you to, 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 to determine at which point that uh, you, you can think of that this burn in uh, step has success, success, successfully finished. Here, we won't have enough time to go into the details. Okay, now let's define the posterior distributions. So the parameters that we have are, are all 17s parameters. The first one is to, this first plot will plot parameter zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, skipping the eight parameters uh, related to viscosities and the 50 and 60. So over here, we are really skipping eta over s and the theta over s related parameters. And let's just focus on the, well, let's treat them all as nuisance parameters at this point because we are primarily interested in these two objects and we will plot their uh, posterior distributions. Yeah, oh, okay. It actually looks like this. Uh, so here you notice that uh, it's a two-dimensional two diagonal plot. Uh, uh, sub okay, so let's focus on, focus on the diagonal plots. It's uh, the one parameter marginalized distributions of, uh, okay, the name of the parameter has already been uh, shown on the left. So here you notice that uh, you have also a black line plotted over here. These are the true parameters that we used in this validation set. So in this case, you actually are pretty confident that uh, this uh, framework is working as expected, is that uh, the posterior that you extract using the pseudo data, is actually correctly reflects where are the truths of this, the parameters that you put in to generate the pseudo data. For example, for this normalization, what we put in is, uh, uh, okay, I didn't print out the, the value that we put in, but uh, you, you can see that it, it actually agrees pretty well with the peak locations. And in some cases, it may, may, may not exactly appear at the peak, but as I said, you really need to take this distribution seriously as long as they are still within the high likelihood regions, uh, then, then this test is, uh, we, we should consider this test to be successful. And in this plot, we will plot uh, eta over s and the uh, zeta over s related parameters. So parameter number seven to 10 are the four parameters that uh, parameterize uh, eta over s. Parameter 11 to 14 are the four parameters that uh, is for zeta over s. Okay, so that's basically the same plot as root, but just uh, plotting different parameters. Okay, again, you can see that uh, although in each individual parameters are not like, very tightly constrained, but uh, they, the high likelihood region definitely really covers uh, the, the true parameters. And remember that uh, the way we parameterize eta rs and zeta rs as a function of temperature can be somewhat arbitrary. So it's not very meaningful to look at this in each of the individual parameters that we parameterize a function. What's more meaningful is that you convert these parameters into the actual shape of zeta rs and eta rs as a function of temperature. 
that is what we did for uh, over here. Uh, let's. Okay. Uh, remember to ch change this back to true. Otherwise, this optimization procedure will, will take you maybe another 10 minutes also. Uh, let's change back to true. So you remember that the, this are the, 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 the full outcome of the Bayesian analysis is a n dimensional posterior distributions. So all the information is contained in this distribution. But sometimes we just want to use one set of parameter to represent uh, the outcome of the fit. Of course, it will be somewhat biased by just using one set of parameters to, to, to represent the whole, whole analysis. But this is sometimes you, you have to do because uh, you cannot really run the full model at every point of the posterior. And one definition that we use usually uh, consider is this so-called uh, 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 maximum a posterior, which is actually the, 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 the parameter that maximize the posterior distribution. And sometimes we use this as a function that maximize uh, uh, to, to represent the, the effect of your feet. But, but remember, this is really just a one, one set of parameters. It has no means to be uh, reflecting everything uh, uh, precisely. So, so here you may notice that uh, uh, it doesn't really agree with the, the data. This, this is because we are plotting the pseudo data, not, not the experimental data. So we will we'll come back to this point later. So what we I want you to look at is this posterior for viscosity. Okay, let's uh, run, run through this block. Okay. So now you see that uh, you have the truth function that we have put in to generate the pseudo data, and you have the marginalized uh, uh, shear viscosity distribution at each temperature. You notice that uh, it's actually also recovered pretty well from this uh, uh, distribute uh, uh, from 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 the Bayesian analysis. That the truth is actually very close to the median of our uh, analysis. The same is true for bulk viscosity. In this case, the truth uh, compared with the marginalized, the median of your Bayesian analysis is very, actually very close. Oh, of course, uh, at each individual temperature, they may not exactly agree, but uh, you have to understand this in a probabilistic way that the truth uh, plus or minus 80% credible intervals uh, so as the truth is uh, contained within the median plus or minus 80 or 90 percent of credible intervals. Okay, now I would like to so, so now that we have this validate at least using a single pseudo data that uh, this Bayesian framework actually works, I would like you to go back to. this point where we choose what type of experimental data we want to use. Basically back to this uh, step five and change it to do validation to false. So this will let you to use the actual experimental data and I, I will let you to run uh, what we have done uh, in the past uh, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, until you get the posterior distribution for the shear and bulk viscosities. So I will give you some time to, to run through these blocks. And then once you have finished, please let me know at the chat box. Okay, I will also run on my side. One vision to false will load the actual experimental data and define the likelihood also using experimental data and experimental uncertainties. And I think it has been pretty automatic is that uh, as long as you set that to false, 
it will load the pre-generated uh, experimental chain. What you will see is that uh, this is the actual comparison with experimental data. Of course, in this case, you don't have a, the, the, the so-called truth value to, to be referenced to as what we did in the validation case. Uh, so now we have really have to, so, so that's why you really have to do this validation first so that you, you gain more, more confidence that what you extract over here is, uh, will be reasonable in the best case scenario. So that's the uh, eight parameters that will be marginalized over. Notice that this Trento P parameters is also peaked at zero as expected. This tau, tau R and alpha is related to the uh, uh, free streaming time. You can also try to extract just these two parameters and to plot what is the posterior for streaming time as a function of energy densities. Uh, the speed pi is probably some uh, second order transport coefficient that we also varied in the uh, Bayesian analysis. And this switching time scale is the time at which we perform the particleization. Oh, by the way, all this analysis is based on the, uh, the grad expansion choice of the particleization models. In the real analysis, we have the same plot for all three different choices of the particleization models. And, and, and that's how you get three posteriors and from which you can, you can do the Bayesian model average. And these are the eight parameters related to the shear and bulk viscosities. Uh, they are even less constrained when you compare it to experiment data with uh, finite uncertainties. But this is okay because each individual parameter doesn't have a physical meaning. What is physical is actually this shape. So here, this shape is actually the uh, Mar the marginalized shear viscosity at each temperatures. And uh, you can see that what we get from this, at least from this, uh, this choice of the model is that the shear viscosity in the median is roughly a constant. Uh, maybe you can have some temperature dependencies, but right now we don't have enough, uh, 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 enough evidence to, to say that with just one beam energy collisions. I think if you also include gold gold at 200 GeVs, uh, it may suggest a slightly stronger temperature dependencies because these two different data sets are sensitive to different temperature regions. And this is the map, uh, which is the parameter set that maximize the posterior distributions. And you can see that uh, um, it suggests to be some constant and, and even, even with some decreasing trend of uh, versus temperature. But, but again, this map is just one, one particular set of parameters in the posterior. Your, your full conclusion is still, should still be based on the distribution. So that's, that's the spirit of the, the Bayesian analysis. What you also find interesting is that uh, you, 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 you cannot see that there's a neck of this uh, extraction that the uncertainty is minimized around maybe 180 to 200 MeV. So this is another advantage of using the Bayesian analysis is that it really lets you to vary all the parameters and see which is the temperature region that you are, you are gaining the most sensitivity from the experimental data. And this sensitivity analysis 
it's uh, really useful because it tells you what you can really learn, what can you cannot learn from the existing sets of the experimental measurements. This is also the same in other cases for bulk viscosities. In this case, the uncertainty is even larger, but you have uh, maximized the uh, constraining power around uh, by looking at the, the, the width of the band, maybe around 170 to, to, to 200 MeV. So that's the region where you, you gain the most sensitivity uh, to bulk viscosity. Okay, do you have any question at this point? I can pause for some time or questions. There's a question on Slack. Okay. Um, Let me check. Uh, oh, I see. Sometimes we see a posterior distribution that are very flat. How do we know if it is because small effects on the chosen final observables or if it's an issue with the prior? Uh, this is actually a good question. Uh, let me see if I can give you an example. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so for example, if I look at, uh, uh, for example, this B pi, like, let, let's look at the, uh, the second to the last parameter is pi, which has a very broad distribution and we vary it from two to eight, I think. So, so, so the reason that you get this can indeed come from, from two, uh, two different re reasons. One is that your, your, your observables are not sensitive to pi, which gives you this flat distribution. Another one is that you are not varying B pi large enough. For example, if you vary B pi to 100, maybe that will be strongly disfavored by the data and then you will have a, a peak around four. Uh, so, so this is again, uh, goes back to the question of the prior, is that this B pi, I think, uh, is already varied by a pretty large amount. I think there are some some causality constraint on, on on this parameter if I remember correctly, that we are all we are varying it uh, almost to the lowest possible values, and uh, varied by a factor of uh, four in this case, and for some parameters, changing it from by order of magnitude doesn't really mean that you have a model response that also changes by order of magnitude. So sometimes uh, this range is already large enough in the sense that uh, you are ex exploring the region where the model responds the most to these parameters. For example, for this uh, switch and scale parameters, if you restrict the temperature region to 0.13 and 0.14, for example, if you only explore this low temperature region for these parameters, again, you will get a very flattened uh, 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 posterior distribution, but but in this case we know that uh, this is simply because you are not allowing uh, the switching temperature to, to to be high enough. So I think the criteria is that you have to make sure that to, when you vary the parameters, you have to make sure that this var this changes cause enough change in your model predictions uh, for those regions where it doesn't cost you enough changes, you, you can safely cut it at that value. For example, in, in some parameterizations, <clears throat> uh, when you parameterize fluctuations, for example, you want to parameterize the variance of fluctuations. And if your variance parameters this is already parameterized a very narrow distribution, there's no point to make it even narrower, right? A delta function and a very narrow Gaussian distribution their variance parameters may, may 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 change, but uh, there's no point in 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 in, in changing that to, to that to that that narrow width because your model are not going to be sensitive to that change. Uh, I'm not sure if I answer this question because this is indeed a very subtle problem that uh, uh, before you 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 change the post change the prior, you will never know 
which one is going to be constrained and uh, whether you need to increase the, the range or not. Let us see what's other. Okay, so flat prior indicates small sensitivity. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's a valid answer, but uh, again, sometimes this is just because you are not varying the parameter uh, you know, range large enough. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so after this, I will also let you to try. Oh, no, not at this point, but uh, uh, after all these lectures, is that uh, you can change run MCMC to true and you can try to use other validation sets. Uh, in principle, this goes from all the way from zero to 99, which lets you to validate this whole procedure in every corner of the parameter space. Because only after you have done this, you will gain enough confidence that uh, this patient workflow uh, is at least trustworthy in the best case scenario. And you are safe to use it to extract experimental data where you don't have a, a truth value for reference. So on your own time, you can try to maybe change the validation. For example, set of five, which generates a pseudo data at a different input parameter point and you perform this whole analysis. But, but, but remember, in that case, you have to generate a new chain by changing this to true, and it may take uh, several hours uh, to, to validate that. Right. Oh, by the way, this is the, the descriptive power of the maximum and posterior sets of parameters, including its uh, uh, emulator uncertainties and this distributed power compared with the experimental data. So you, you can see that after the calibration, uh, it works pretty well. Of course, you still have, uh, you, you can have some tensions, especially regarding this uh, pi KP ratios of mean PT. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, I think if you also look at the mark multiplicities, you also see the same problem is that. Uh, Sometimes the pi and over proton ratios are harder to reproduce by, uh, I think, one of the, 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 the choice of the, the particle addition models. Okay. So the last session of this uh, 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 notebook is that uh, to try to quantify the information gain within the KL divergence. So here we are really taking the very simple calculation of KL divergence is that uh, we are not trying to compare the information gain uh, at uh, uh, of this entire function. What we are really doing is that we we will slice this posterior into different temperature regions and see the marginalized uh, distribution at each temperature and see how much information gain you can get from at each temperature. So to do so. We will first uh, get a sets of uh, uh, <clears throat> post uh, uh, prior distribution. We will sample uh, just like we did when you plot the prior. Uh, we will get the prior from 120 MeV to 50 uh, to 500 MeV, and then you sample this uh, four-dimensional uh, random values. Or 500,000 times. And then you rescale each of these random variables to the, to the prior region of this uh, uh, four parameters related to eta over s. And then you get a prior distribution for eta over s in this case. You can perform the same for zeta over s. Uh, it takes some time because I, I somehow put a large number over here. Uh, okay. 
And then we also have the posterior iterators, which is what we get when we generate the plot like this. So now we have the both the prior and posterior. Uh, we can plot, for example, if we choose the temperature indices to be 10, we can get uh, the marginalized distribution of eta over s at uh, t equals to f. Let me make this more explicit. We are really, what we are really plotting is eta over s at t equals to uh, t equals to point. Okay, point one nine eight GeV, and here you see what the prior distribution is, which is the blue line, and you see after the constraint, the posterior becomes narrower. And what we want to quantify using the KL divergence is to use a number to tell us how different are the posterior distribution versus the prior. And uh, here I just repeat the the calculation of the KL divergence again is that when you have these two distributions, the blue one and the red one, uh, you just uh, perform this calculation, which is guaranteed to be greater than zero. And we'll interpret as the distances between two distribution objects of the prior and posterior. And as a simple example, you can compute the KL divergence for two Gaussians with different mean and different uh, variants, uh, different standard deviations. And you can compute this scale divergence to be a quantity that looks like this. So notice that you get more information again in two cases. One is that when the mean of the posterior is very different from the mean of the prior. In this case, you are learning something less expected, which will give you a large scale divergence. Another case that is that you, you learn things with more certainty, less uncertainties. Uh, in this case, is that uh, the, the the variance? Oh, uh, if the the width of the posterior is much narrower than the prior, then in this case, this scale divergence is also large, which means that you are learning something with more uncertain with more certainty. That's also a type of information again. Uh, of course, in principle, this uh, width can be larger than the prior, but, that, but this is not allowed in our setup because we are already assuming that uh, the prior is a flat distribution within some range, then there's no way that you can uh, get a variance larger than that. Okay. And now this is just a, a very, Simple minded way of uh, computing this uh, integration is just we just uh, take the histogram of Px and, and Qx with P being the posterior, Q being the prior, and we will just integrate this histogram. There has to be a better way of directly uh, evaluating this from samples, but right now uh, I'm just using this uh, histogram way to do this. So you notice that uh, I, I first histogram the, the prior samples and the histogram the posterior samples. And what I do is that I will integrate posterior times log of posterior over prior. And then you can compute the, the information again at this temperature, which is, oh, which is order one quantity. So you have a pretty significant information again at 200 GeV. And here is that we can plot this information again as a function of temperatures. Uh, so in this function, you can either choose to uh, compute the information again of eta over s or zeta over s. And we will loop over all the temperatures and plot KL divergence as a function of temperature. 
So notice that most of the information again happens around uh, below 200 MeV, and you have stiff information again at high temperatures. You still have a slightly information gain in this case, but this really comes from that uh, when you constrain low temperatures, your high temperature prior also gets affected. Uh, the reason that uh, the Jetscape analysis has almost zero information gain at high temperatures is that when you include uh, more than one type of delta F corrections, you you have uh, when you run to the Bayesian model average, the posterior at high temperature gets even wider, uh, which will further decrease this information gain. Right now, we are just assuming using one type of uh, uh, particleization models, so we are somehow not taking all the uncertainties in the model into consideration. This is for the uh, when this is for zeta res. Again, you have uh, most of the information can low temperatures and the even less information can compared to previous case at high temperatures. So this is also what I find to be very useful when you have uh, functional objects where it's harder to, to separate the prior effects and the, the data constraining power. But by computing this, uh, you can see what is the feature that you are actually learned from the data and what is the feature that uh, will just to give you back the prior. So in this case, uh, if we overlay that information again with this plot, what we can really trust it is this constraint below 200 MeV and all this functional shape at high temperature will be strongly dependent on your prior assumptions. So for example, I can plot, uh, uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, okay, let me just copy this. Okay, so if you overlay this information again versus the uh, actual uh, posterior, uh, you notice that the what, what data truly tells you is the uh, zeta or s at low temperature region while at high temperature, this feature not are not come from data, but comes from your prior parameterization. So this is a very important practice in how to interpret your final results. Okay, uh, that's all about uh, this notebook. Uh, this notebook actually uses code that comes from the actual Bayesian analysis code in uh, used in Jetscape analysis. In fact, if you go back to the Jupyter notebook, notebook or, or simply go to, into the folders, you will find a folder called Jetscape code and raw data. So this will actually contains the actual a, a, a Python script that is used for this analysis. And a lot of this code you see in this notebook is actually comes directly comes from uh, some, some code sections over here. Uh, but if you want to use this for your own uh, studies, uh, actually a lot of this, uh, for example, Bayesian experiments, beans and cuts, calculations and load experiment data uh, are really handled in the input and output like preparing your model calculations into the correct data format. But the core of Bayesian analysis, including the, the, the uh, machine learning stuff are really has already been covered in this notebook. And this part is basically the same uh, for every analysis. What has changed is how you prepare uh, data IO. And uh, most of the time we'll actually be spending on actually generating the uh, design calculations. Okay, so what we not do not cover in this uh, notebook is the emulator validation. So, so what we will perform is validation the whole Bayesian analysis framework at one validation set, but you can also perform individual validation in at every stage of your analysis. For example, emulator validations. Uh, we don't perform a full culture test, which requires you to run all the 100 validation points to quantify the performance in the entire parameter space. 
we have really only tested the performance at the validation point number zero. Uh, we haven't tested MCMC convergence or, or, or whether we have really reached the, the summarizations, uh, et cetera. This is also very important to check. And finally, what we haven't covered is the predictive power of the calibrated model. So the predictive power is that uh, now that you can explain all this experimental data, which is good, but it's also useful to use this uh, parameter size to make new predictions uh, so that you are not just extracting sets of parameters, but you are also checking whether uh, the model is general enough that it's not overfitting any of these uh, parameters. Okay, I guess that's all I need to cover. Uh, I will continue to take questions. And uh, if you have time, you can start to try, for example, uh, run the true MCMC chain on yourself. Okay, then yes, I will first stop sharing and uh, give back to Lauren and Trin for other questions. Okay, 